So this will be a lecture introducing this book, Echoes of Coherence, Trinitarian Theology and Science Together. I'm going to focus my remarks on chapter 3, which is the coherent history of ideas in theology and science. But I want to begin by introducing the book. And I'm sure you've wanted to know what coherence means. It would be a good start. It's not the same as incoherence, though you may, may feel like that sometimes tonight. The idea of coherence is of two entities that can be in each other and still be what they are. Inness without merger is a way to describe it. This concept comes from a theological source. The Church Fathers spoke about the two natures of Christ, his divine nature and his human nature, that each is in the other, yet Christ is not a mixture of those, those two natures, as each remains distinct. There is indeed even, even an asymmetry about this relationship in that it is the divine Son who takes into himself our humanity. And of course, I believe this is mirrored in the asymmetric coherence of theology and science. Similarly, in Trinitarian theology, the persons of the Godhead are coherent. That is, each is in the other. Jesus said, I am in my Father and my Father is in me. Yet each is not the other. The Son is not the Father and the Father is not the Son. By way of analogy, rather than univocally, I offer examples in the book of echoes of coherence in the creation God has made, first from an ontological perspective, that is to do with being. I do so with care. This study does not encourage an overly facile form of vigilant Trinitarianism that looks for images of the Trinity everywhere, in three-leaf clovers, in water as liquid, ice, or steam, or in Russian dolls that fit the one within the other, and so on. All analogies for the Trinity are actually inadequate, and in some cases they are either modalist or tritheistic and therefore heretical. However, I will suggest that there are conceptual resonances of the Trinity in creation, mediated by the Incarnation. If the creation bears the marks of its Creator and its incarnate Redeemer, this will not be a surprising claim. The creation is, according to Colin Gunton, a perichoresic, perichoresis, or coherence, of related systems. And in physics, Graham Buxton comments on the new awareness that everything in the universe is bound up with everything else. Indeed, that all things are what they are because they're related to everything else. One could add, from the chemist's perspective, that there is also a remarkable common constituency to all matter, whether terrestrial or extraterrestrial, and a tendency for elements to bond in accordance with electron affinities. But enough of that for now. I also suggest in the book that how humans know what they know in both theology and in science is also coherent. So ontology being and knowing, secondly, is coherent. That is, the epistemology in both disciplines is the same. It is one of that might be called critical realism. Personal knowledge, to quote Michael Polanyi, an acknowledgement of the myth of pure objectivity in a way that resonates strongly with the Trinitarian sentiments of theologian T.F. Torrance, theoretical chemist Werner Heisenberg, most well-known for Heisenberg uncertainty principle, states incessantly in agreement uh, with Gadamer and Heidegger that one has to suppress any rigid distinction between subject and object. I argue, therefore, against the view that theology and science are in conflict the old warfare model. This is the model, popular today, still, being perpetuated by people like Richard Dawkins, for example, who recently said, Darwin kicked God out of biology, but physics remained more uncertain. Stephen Hawking is now administering the coup de grace. I argue even against the more respectful model of Stephen Jay Gould that theology and science are non-overlapping magisteria. I offer even a nuancing of the mutuality model of Paget, suggesting that theology and science do have profound mutuality, 
but that they are their own distinct disciplines, that is, that they are indeed mutually interpenetrating without merger, without loss of identity, which is to say, coherent. In other words, in this book, I hope to offer a framework big enough to hold both disciplines, one that accounts for epistemological and ontological resonances between God, his creation, and science. I suggest, therefore, that the disciplines or thought areas of Christian theology and science are also coherent. I do so in such a way that preserves the primacy of theology as the queen of sciences. And you'll have to read more about that in the book. Thus, there are, in fact, three primary goals in this book. I describe, I support, and I suggest or propose. First of all, I describe and offer explanation of the coherence concept from the Incarnation and the Trinity. Secondly, I support and clarify claims of the legitimacy and limits of the application of coherence by way of analogy to humanity and creation. Scripture and the tradition speak of humans as the image of God, and the tradition building on biblical inferences speaks of the non-human creation as containing traces of the triune God, as opposed to image. This leads us to demonstrate various resonances between the nature of God as Trinity, Trinitarian theology, and various aspects of creation as discovered by science. But thirdly, building on these resonances between Trinitarian theology and science, I suggest or propose, rather than impose, that they may as disciplines be considered to be coherent. Now, I can't do all of those three things tonight, and I want to focus only on how the ideas behind Christian theology and science in their very historical development are surprisingly coherent. But before I do that, let me highlight the urgency of this matter so that we answer the question, what does it matter anyway? As I have said, the need for conciliation between Christianity and science arises first out of perceived differences in how we know and what we know in each case. What plagues so many of us as members of Western society, ensconced as we are within enduring enlightenment assumptions, is that these disciplines operate in different realms of knowing. So the popular modern way of thinking about this is that science is sometimes deemed to be the realm of objective thinking based on hard evidence, whilst religion is assumed to be the subjective realm along with the values and the arts. On this account, only science, because it deals in facts, can be present in the public square. Religion, because it deals with feelings and values and wishes, belongs in the private realm. These unfortunate assumptions have bifurcated and impoverished the intellectual life of Western humanity, thereby, I would argue, dehumanizing it. British scientist and novelist C.P. Snow exposed this problem for modernity as far back as 1959, when in his Cambridge Senate House address, now Uh, published as The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution, he declared that Western intellectual life was split into the titular two cultures of the sciences and the humanities, and that this was a serious obstacle to solving the world's problems. I remember doing uh, high school A-levels and O-levels growing up in Rhodesia, and you had to choose between sciences and the arts around about the age of 16. That's how how, how it was, reflecting culture of Britain. The burden of his address, then, seems to have been the lack of scientific knowledge. So, with regard to arts and the sciences, he was concerned in those days with a British culture that favored the arts and had no knowledge of science. Applying this to the contemporary Christian church in the West, I think, has some real traction. The scandal of the evangelical mind has been well reported in general, and specifically with respect to knowledge in science in the Christian church. Though it was aimed at the many arts-oriented folk in the UK at that time, Snow's rebuke might justly be applied to those contemporary evangelical Christians alarmed by the findings of astronomical and biological science in particular. The people of Britain in Snow's time, he laments, could not give definitions of the second law of thermodynamics, let alone mass, or acceleration, which is the scientific equivalent of saying, can you read? The great edifice of modern physics, says Snow, was going up, said Snow, and the majority of the cleverest people in the Western world 
had about as much insight into it as their Neolithic ancestors would have had. It's a pretty high standard. But if the primary barrel of the guns of Snow's diatribe had to do with a scientific deficit, in today's very technological Western societies, it is possible that it is the second barrel of the arts and theology that needs to be fired most urgently in our time. The brilliant work of Ian McGilchrist provides the critique of modern Western culture that it is demonstrating symptoms on a large scale that result from the dominance of the left hemisphere of the brain, such that the right hemisphere is underdeveloped and underused. The right hemisphere, the master, which governs metaphor, music, imagination, poetry, and faith, is intended to take the lead, whilst the left hemisphere, which crunches the numbers and writes text messages with our thumbs, facilitates the details, in other words, is designed to back up the master, it's the emissary. The result of left brain or emissary dominance in Western technological culture, according to McGilchrist, has taken over the right brain master, which in a culture has the same effect as when the bean counters take over the business. For McGilchrist, the larger purpose of being human, living into the good, the true, and the beautiful, is thus sacrificed for bean counting. If McGilchrist is to be believed, then what is at stake in the science-theology divide is the very question of what it means to be human. In Western society, the dualism of reason and faith, or fact and value, has served to distance science and Christian theology. This robs science and scientists of the wider context and meaning of their discovery. One of these is the loss of awareness of the particular context of the social and global arena of science. I refer to the theological context of the doctrine of creation and the cultural mandate of the early chapters of Genesis, including stewardship and the care of creation. Given that knowledge and care of creation is one of the important dimensions of what it means to be made in the image of God and therefore to be human, the loss of this perspective is regrettable, diminishing something of the richness of the vocational significance of being a scientist a loss of the awareness of a God who is both large enough and small enough, because he is Trinity, transcendent and imminent, loss of awareness of that God who is large enough and small enough to create and sustain the cosmos whilst granting to creation and humans a freedom to be derived in his freedom and to participate in its own creation also robs the scientist of a doxological and priestly orientation. The ability of scientists to perceive more than fact, but also the beauty of the creation, from molecule to galaxy, and to create what is beautiful, in light of the beauty of the triune God, is thus also robbed of its context. So now, with some awareness of what's at stake, let us pursue this notion that actually the history of ideas in theology and science has historically been very much intertwined, that is, coherent. This claim that with respect to the history of ideas, Christian theology and the natural sciences are deeply intertwined will definitely seem counterintuitive to contemporary scientists. Yet as T.F. Torrance and others have contended, science has in fact, historically speaking, developed and prospered in the context of Christian civilization and during and since the Reformation in particular, precisely because there is a consonance with respect to the history of ideas in each discipline. Just a few words about this remarkable theologian, Tom Torrance, whose work I've conversed with a lot in this book. Mick Habits has commented that Torrance's academic career was almost entirely absorbed with concerns over methodology, a clearing of the epistemological ground for a starting point in theological discourse. This search for an explicitly Christian epistemology took him in the direction of interaction with the natural sciences to the extent that he articulated theology as indeed the science of theology, as is reflected in his book, Theological Science. This association of the scientific and the theological initially created significant misunderstanding and misgiving about Torrance's theological and methodological vision for many people, as Elmer Elmer Collier has indicated. However, once it was clarified that this did not imply a, quote, pre-conceived idea of science as a universally applicable method, some kind of scientia universalis, with presuppositions and or procedures to which all 
sciences, including theology, must conform if they're to be scientific. Fears of practitioners in both science and theology were allayed. Rather, each science, says Collier, had to be developed catafusen, that Latin term which means according to the nature of the object, in strict conformity to the nature of the object being studied, including theology, which because of the transcendent nature of its object and because of the reality that only God can reveal God, has its own particular requirements and procedures as a science. In particular, the legitimacy and value of a Trinitarian coherence model for holding theology and science together is proposed and supported by Torrance. Though not a scientist by training, Torrance spent 20 years studying science while he was a theology professor. He won the Templeton Prize in theology and science, and uh, not only was remarkably awarded an honorary doctorate at Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, which is no Christian university. But he was compared by the awarding principal to Albert Einstein. He observed the scientific method of Einstein closely and noted the methodology of science as well as the levels and layers of meaning in science. Sir Bernard Lovell, to whom he was related, and the works of physicist James Maxwell, an organic chemist turned philosopher, Michael Polanyi also had a significant impact on his thought and method. It is most interesting that the American physicist Jim Neidhart approvingly notices the coherent approach in Torrance's work. In Ground and Grammar of Theology, Torrance speaks of how the divine and human natures of the incarnate Christ interpenetrate each other without the integrity of either being damaged by the other. Neidhart, in response to these words, applies this to the disciplines of theology and science giving what I believe to be the most articulate definition of coherence I have ever seen. This is from a physicist. This is very regent. The word, he says, indicates a sort of dynamic mutual containing or mutual involution of realities, which is often spoken of as coherence. The root chora is also present in the word choreography, which describes the orchestration of dancers, indicating the root's dynamic aspect. Such a dynamic coherence between theology and science would preserve the dignity of both disciplines while healing the breach that has opened up between them, said Neidhart. For, he says, for a very confused culture that accepts the legitimacy of both astrology and the findings of satellite-based astronomy, Neidhart believes that a deeper clarified understanding of the perichoresis between theology and natural science could have a substantial healing impact upon our scientific technological society, for such a refined understanding would restore the sense of purpose and moral guidance our civilization lacks. This does not understate what is at stake in this matter. Torrance's research reveals, to quote him, the narrative of a complex interdependent history in which ideas from the disciplines of theology and science tend to cross-fertilize with one another, concluding that there is a substantial overlap between natural science and Christian theology in their histories of development. And that's the theme of chapter 3. Building on Torrance's insight, I trace the history of science with a particular eye towards the flourishing of science within a Christian context, in marked contrast to other cultural contexts where it could not flourish, including the ancient Greek context, as well as marking the shift away from Christianity and modernity with this particular view of reason. Noting the deconstruction of the modern hypothesis in the postmodern era, I then present a view of reason and faith that offers a kinder window for the coherence of science and theology, one that acknowledges the myth of pure reason, one that concedes that the subject and the object cannot be divided, one that admits the place of faith in reason that is the epistemology of critical realism, which I deal with in detail in the book and can't deal with much tonight. Now, in considering the coherence of the history of ideas, I want to speak to three headings. First heading, the birthing and flourishing of science within the Christian context. It's probably a big surprise for people to know that science actually began and flourished within a Christian context. The utter failure of the conflict model, I believe, is related to the fact 
that there are ontological realities which already demonstrate overlap between these disciplines. And I want to speak to four ontological realities very quickly. Number one, God created the universe, and therefore to study it is already theology. Because it contains, as Michael Hanby, the Catholic scholar, says, vestigia trinitate, vestiges of the Trinity. Science, in other words, can't be done without metaphysical and theological emphasis, emphasis uh, or assumptions, I should say. The universe is itself a fundamentally metaphysical and theological concept. So metaphysics and theology are not optimal are not optional, I should say, in the realm of science. There is an irreducibly metaphysical and theological dimension to scientific inquiry that is not obviated by retreat to the putative neutrality of scientific method. To summarize it another way, for scientists, it is not a question of whether they will have a theology, but what theology they will have. So that's the first ontological reality, that God, a doctrine of creation, God created it. Secondly, related to that is God created it and is distinct from creation. Creation is not God. He's at an, uh, creation and God are at an ontological remove, and therefore creation is not too sacred to study. There were certain cultures where science could never flourish because they were afraid of creation, and they sacralized it and couldn't touch it. But the Christian point of view is that creation is not God, but it is good, and therefore it can be studied. And that's the third ontological reality that makes it impossible to keep these two disciplines apart. It's the reality, thirdly, that the creation is good and can be studied and is worthy of studied. The fact that it is logical that we can line up the elements of the periodic table in that kind of an order is itself a remarkable reality that tells us the universe is conducive to study and that perhaps there is a good God behind that order that enables us to discover these things. And then fourthly, the empirical manner in which Christianity as an historic faith was affirmed corresponds to the empirical nature of science, especially if scientific evidence is evaluated according to the falsificationism of Popper rather than the verificationism of Carnap. And to find out a little bit about those terms, I recommend that you buy my book. Let's now consider these realities of Christian theology and how this led, and how uh, within the context of Christian theology, the birth of science, especially in the medieval period, as a result of the doctrine of creation and incarnation, and then later in the Renaissance, um, how this came to be. So second heading, as we think about the history of ideas, is the compatibility with medieval Renaissance, the medieval Renaissance and Renaissance Christian context. So empirical science involves sensuous experience, and it took root in distinctly theological soil. In particular, the Christian doctrine of creation and the incarnation, which validated matter, was crucial to this. And this is aptly expressed in Lauren Wilkinson's statement that this empirical knowledge came to be valued, quote, through the Christian experience of the creator God of love, who invented physical reality, and who in Jesus became a part of it. The contingency of the creator in his creating and the consequent contingency of creation was a further theological understanding which was amenable to the development of science in that it highlighted the need for empirical evidence. The creation, like who God is, said Wilkinson, is inexhaustible surprising and gracious. Knowledge comes through engaged experience, not detached contemplation. The origins of science and the Christian tradition have been well documented in the work of the Oxford philosopher Michael Foster in the 1930s. These findings are all the more remarkable for the charged context in which they were made, a context where any influence of Christianity on the development of science was considered to be negative. The mood was captured by the words of atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell at the beginning of his history, Western philosophy, in which science which gave knowledge was contrasted with theology, which induces, quote, a dogmatic belief 
that we have knowledge where in fact we have ignorance, and by doing so generates a kind of impertinent insolence towards the universe. The stage had been set for this conflict already by Wilson Draper's warfare model, expounded in his controversially titled History of the Conflict Between Science and Religion. He opined that by its devaluing of science, Christianity had become a stumbling block in the intellectual development of Europe for more than a thousand years. It is worthy of note that these hard attitudes towards Christianity were not without some reason. The church has, had not always had a great record with regard to listening to science. The oft-invoked refusal of the Catholic Church to accept the discovery of Copernicus, Copernicus, that the earth was not the center of the solar system, and the excommunication of Galileo for believing this is usually held up as irrefutable evidence of just this kind of incommensurability. I want to say here right away, though, that Peter Harrison has in fact shown that this was not so much a conflict between the church and science, but between these, these astronomers and the scientists of the day who advised the church and who considered the new evidence insufficient to overturn the prevailing view. In light of this, Foster's work is all the more poignant. His meticulously reasoned articles, written not as Christian theology or apologetics, says Wilkinson, but simply as a careful exercise in the history of thought with the beginning of a slow but thorough change in this image of warfare. And it is now widely acknowledged that some aspects of medieval Christianity were not only a fertile seedbed for modern science, but quite possibly a necessary, a necessary condition for its eventual development. The primary thesis in Foster's argument was that Greek science had never moved beyond its embryonic stage because it assumed that genuine knowledge was, as in a mathematical proof, always a matter of abstract reasoning from certain first principles. Crucial to this thesis was the reality that what modern empirical science and a Christian worldview share in both cases over against Greek philosophy is the part which sensuous experience plays in it. In Christian thought, this is emphasized by St. John, who wrote in his first epistle that the Christian faith was grounded in sensual, empirical experience of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Not that sensuous experience was unknown to the Greeks. It was just that it was not valued highly in the realm of natural philosophy. By contrast, knowledge of the God who created physical reality and who by the incarnation had become part of it, enhanced the value of things earthy and material. Emphatically, says Lauren Wilkinson, we cannot know the world God has made simply by thinking about it. And he quotes Psalm 34, verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The recognition that sensuous experience is the source of knowledge, he concludes, is basic to Hebrew understanding. And it is here, rather than Greek ideas of the superiority of the knowledge abstracted from the senses, that the tradition of empirical science took root. Other authors have also affirmed this foster hypothesis, including Durham theologian of science, David Wilkinson, who states, and I quote, the warfare language hides the fact that the modern tradition of empirical science has deep roots in the Jewish and Christian tradition. The point was first made clearly in Michael Foster's meticulously reasoned series of articles, The Christian Doctrine of Creation and the Origins of Modern Science, published in the resolutely positivist philosophical journal Mind in 1934. It was only as late medieval Christian thinkers distanced themselves from the Platonic idea that creation was an imperfect manifestation of eternal and perfect ideas in the mind of a transcendent God that they began to be able to appreciate the contingency of creation and thus the necessity of investigating it empirically not in terms of what a rational creator must do, but in terms of what a personal and loving God wills to do. It is no accident that for better and for worse, science is a plant which grew primarily in Christian soil. Third heading under the history of ideas and their coherence. Conflict does arise in the Middle Ages and on into the Reformation period. Whilst this thesis that the values of the doctrine of creation within the Christian faith did indeed have great consonance with what science is and how it developed, and it can stand scrutiny, it must in fairness also be acknowledged that the Christian church did not always apply the empirics on which their historical faith was grounded to science as it developed. 
It did not always read and interpret Scripture well either, compounded by the fact that the institution of the church and its politicking did not always draw on the best ideas of the Christian theologians in their tradition. With respect to the above-mentioned Copernicus, he was ultimately vindicated in his observational approach to the heliocentric issue, accompanied by mathematical calculation, by the empirical approach of Galileo when the latter was able to finally use a telescope. Point is, it wasn't just thinking, but empirical observation and mathematical calculation that resolved this issue. The primary issues of the conflict with the church arose from, number one, a treasured Middle Ages worldview of geocentrism with echoes of the Platonism of the Greeks, which was sometimes influential in the medieval church. And two, the interpretation of Scripture, which was read through geocentric spectacles and with a flat or wooden literalism. Interesting, the view of the universe as geocentric went all the way back to Ptolemy, the Egyptian astronomer of the first half of the second century. The way in which this view changed to heliocentric is actually a remarkable reality. And to quote Alistair McGrath, indeed, it was one of the most significant changes in the human perception of reality to have taken place in the last millennium, in that it was such a radical change from the extant model. Of course, Copernicus' model of planets in circular orbits because it could not account for the data on the motions of the planets, would gave, give way via the work of Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler to a more sophisticated elliptical model. And the mathematical relationship between the square of the periodic time of the, of the planet and the cube of its mean distance from the sun. Jumping ahead for just a moment, there's a great deal of similarity, it seems to me, between the issue of Copernicus and that of evolutionary theory in the 20th century. Though there has been a strand of thoughtful theologians and scientists who have embraced the theory of evolution, what is after all not just a theory, but holds high credibility in the scientific community, and have found it to be compatible with the book of Genesis properly read, the majority of evangelical Christians reject it and are in grave danger of repeating the Galileo-Copernicus fiasco. The church in Copernicus's day was challenged to look again at its interpretation of biblical passages and its indiscriminate enculturation into both Aristotelian philosophy and Pythagorean Neoplatonism. In other words, the data, now clear in its insinuations, had to be taken into account in biblical interpretation. A coherent, a coherent view between theology and science assumes that there will be no contradictions between science and the Bible, but with this important proviso, the Bible as properly interpreted. Actually, the theory of evolution would not, by the way, qualify as science for the verificationist as it involves historical evidence. Nor would the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, for that matter, but on Popper's falsification view, both can be considered to be scientific. The methods and assumptions of biblical interpretation has its own history that's part of this mix. Limiting the progression Alison McGrath has pointed out three primary ways in which Scripture was interpreted in the, in the tradition over the centuries. And I want to add a fourth, which arose from the back-to-the-sources approach of the Reformation. Number one, there was the woodenly literal approach. For example, Genesis 1 was assumed to refer to seven literal 24-hour days. This approach, still alive and well in our times, is really not the literal approach, but the literalistic approach. That is, it neglects the literary genre of the text, and rhetorical, historical approaches, which are in fact part of normal, literal interpretation. Secondly, there has been the allegorical approach, especially evident in the church fathers, so that three non-literal senses of Scripture become admissible in the Middle Ages. Genesis is thus viewed as poetic or allegorical, giving rise to a theology of creation rather than to science. Interestingly, the Western church father of the 4th century, Augustine, somehow knows that the six-day account of Genesis 1 cannot be literal. He believed in fiat creation. Why would God need 24 hours to create what he did each day when, in fact, he made it into existence in a moment's time? 24 hours was just too long. And so he allegorized it as a metaphor for the Christian life. Thirdly, it was the accommodation approach. This approach to Scripture has been very important for permitting dialogue between the physical sciences and theology. It acknowledges the reality that revelation is given in culturally and anthropologically conditioned ways that need to be researched and understood before the interpretive gap can be bridged. 
With respect to the early chapters of Genesis, for example, the language and images that are used are acknowledged to be appropriate to the culture of the original audience and are therefore not to be understood in a wooden literal way. Rather, the key ideas are to be extracted, recognizing that these have, as McGrath has said, been expressed in forms and terms which are specifically adapted or accommodated to the original audience. This approach is not new, but exists in Judaism and in the patristic Christian era. However, its full development development comes in the Protestant Reformation with significant input from John Calvin, which we'll consider in just a moment. The fourth way of interpreting is sometimes called the literal or normal hermeneutic, or rhetorical, historical uh, literal hermeneutic, which treats biblical literature as literature. God breathed literature, as it is media, but, but mediated through human literature and human authors. And researchers, and researchers things like this, this approach researches things like the literary genre of passages and cultural and historical background, like the ancient Near Eastern background of Genesis 1 and 2, for example. This will certainly include the accommodation approach, but it is more broadly the historical critical approach, which is practiced by biblical scholars even in our midst, like Bruce Walke, um, Ian Proven, Philip Long, um, and also by people like John Walton, N.T. Wright, Rick Watts, and uh, McKnight, and, and others. The crucial issue in this method are related to these questions. What kind of text is this? What questions is it really answering for the original audience? What is the authorial intent? This reading of Scripture has been refined in the modern period, but its roots go back to the Reformation, and it is itself a science. The mature development of biblical scholarship and interpretation reflected in especially the latter two approaches which enabled the church to gain a better sense of the place of science, occurs in the 16th century. And seeing as we are celebrating Luther's um, great event, uh, I thought it would be appropriate just to talk for for a few minutes about the the impetus of all this coming from the Renaissance back to the sources and then the Reformation. The accommodation method spoken of above was important in the astronomy debates of the 16th and 17th centuries and in particular the controversy regarding whether the sun revolves around the earth or or vice versa. A hermeneutic or interpretive methodology that avoided this unnecessary conflict between theology and science might in fact be discerned very clearly in John Calvin, 1509-1564. In so doing, Calvin made three important contributions to the development of the natural sciences. A, he encouraged them by positively affirming the scientific study of nature, grounded in his positive theology of creation and its orderliness and the ways in which it reflected the wisdom and power of God. Secondly, he upheld the principle of the perspicuity of Scripture, that is, its clarity. Calvin, like other reformers, did engage with long-standing issues in the tradition, but he also clarified other issues that have been considered to be novel. The mark of the Reformation is the belief that Scripture was the sole, final authority of the church, and that it was capable of being so because it was perspicuous. It did not require the guidance of the church hierarchy, the magisterium, which is not to say it could not be interpreted, which is not to say it could be interpreted individualistically, that is, without the church present and past. However, as Ian Proven affirms, possessing both the Bible in its original languages, or at least in an accurate vernacular translation, and some rudimentary rules of reading, the Reformers believed that no one should have undue difficulty in understanding what the Scripture had to say. The whole matter of going back, that was end quote, the whole matter of going back to the sources in biblical interpretation and exegesis no doubt provided a powerful impetus in the pursuit of knowledge in other areas, including science. It also gave permission for interpretations outside of those of the magisterium that were related to matters of science, thus permitting integrative work. This is illustrated even within the Catholic tradition, for example, where the accommodationist approach of Carmelite friar Francisco Foscarini was hugely important to the debate in the church regarding Galileo in Italy. Thirdly, Calvin removed obstacles to theology-science integration in particular by eliminating a literalistic approach to the Bible and by offering instead the accommodationist viewpoint of biblical interpretation. Calvin's view was that the intent of the Scripture was not to be a scientific textbook, and it wasn't to be treated as such. But rather, it is for the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ. 
McGrath expresses Calvin's view when he avers that the Bible is not an astronomical, geographical, or biological textbook. And when the Bible is interpreted, it must be borne in mind that God adjusts to the capacities of the human mind and heart. God has come down to our level if revelation is to take place. Revelation thus presents a scaled-down or accommodated version of God to us in order to meet our limited abilities. Just as a human mother stoops down to reach her child, so God stoops down to come to our level. Revelation is an act of divine condescension. In his commentary on Genesis, Calvin wrote that Genesis 1 and 2 were written from the perspective of a Hebrew observer and were not to be considered as a modern scientific account. It's important to note in Calvin's discourse the validation of the expertise of the astronomer, and we may extrapolate to the scientist in general, and the encouragement of all who have time and ability to acquaint themselves with science also. However, when Calvin comes to explain why Moses excluded science from his account of the creation, the burden of that explanation is the intent of Moses as author to write for people who are not scientists, so as not to exclude uneducated people, in order that all may acknowledge the creatorial power and majesty of God at whatever level they perceive. It's important to reemphasize that Calvin's viewpoint that Genesis 1 was written for the uneducated, relating to what they can see, did not mean that he did not encourage those who were pursuing knowledge of the science of astronomy. Thus, whilst on the one hand avoiding wooden literalism, Calvin and his institutes espouses a robust theology of creation, grounded in Christology, which pervades the whole narrative of Scripture and focused texts such as John 1 and Colossians 1. Calvin's robust theology of creation became foundational to the world-affirming worldview and scholarship which developed in the Reformed tradition after him. The Calvinist tradition that promoted healthy science-theology dialogue continued into the era of modernity, reaching its epitome in T.F. Torrens. He has written at length about the gains or the promise and excitement that have arisen since the time of the Reformation. That is, since the ground has been uh, cleared in the most remarkable way of the old dualist and atomistic modes of thought that have plagued theology for centuries. A new and exciting era had for Torrance been ushered in not only by the developments in empirical science, but also by the recovery of the importance of the doctrine of the Trinity through Karl Barth, with the Incarnation as its historically empirical revelation. The fact that creation is reified by the Incarnation, even for the triune God himself, removes all dualism and justifies the study of creation and invites us to look for echoes of the ontorelational in creation in science. Thus, the ontorelational grammar of Christian theology, centered in the Trinity, seen as perichoretic persons in relation, can inform science, justifies and invites the exploration that inspires science, and keeps science in a priestly and doxological mode. But science, with its stringent methodology, And its insight into all reality in turn influences theology to be equally rigorous and empirical in its approach. Theology and science done in cognizance of each other, together in this coherent way, is what excited Torrance. However, Torrance was not naive about this new era. The ontorelational way of thinking he knew to be difficult for us in the West due to the impact of atomism, ancient and modern in our culture. He speaks of long-ingrained habits of mind and of speech, with which we are beset in the Latin Greek tradition of Western culture and the static connecting with which we have been accustomed to operate in our linear logic. In particular, it is Tarns's integrative approach of the perichoretic interpretation of theology and natural science that might serve as a base for both scientists and theologians as they build bridges between the disciplines. In conclusion, Einstein once commented on the relations between religion and science. He said this, Though religion may be that which determines the goal, it has nevertheless learned from science in the broadest sense what means will contribute to the attainment of the goals it has set up. But science can only be created by those who are thoroughly imbued with the aspiration towards truth and understanding. This source of feeling, however, springs from the sphere of religion. To this there also belongs the faith in the possibility that the regulations valid for the world of existence are rational. That is comprehensible to reason. I cannot conceive of a genuine scientist without that profound faith. The situation may be expressed by an image. Science without religion is lame. 
Religion without science is blind. Most importantly, on the blindness of science, what Michael Hanby shows is that metaphysics always accompanies scientific theories in a way that is often unrealized by its protagonists and thus reveals the catholicity of reality which propels science beyond the debilitating confines of its own ontology. Scientific theories and God are distinguishable, but they're just not separable. They are coherent, in other words. Thank you very much, Ross. And so we are going to have two respondents who have some comments to make about Ross's work. We're going to go in alphabetical order, starting with the letter A. Rob Allure, friend of Regent and a friend of many of yours, uh, has an uh, unusual background and is well prepared to comment on this. He's a scientist and a pastor. So his um, doctorate is in immunology from the University of Toronto and is a uh, geneticist and works uh, particularly is known for his work on gene therapy strategies and the nervous system. And on top of all that, he is the pastor of St. Mark's Parish down the way and a Catholic chaplain at UBC, a member of the Jesuit order, and someone we're always delighted to have engage with us at Regent College. So, Rob, come give us your thoughts. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Professor Hastings, for, for your talk and for the invitation uh, to be part of this conversation up here at Regent College. It's uh, particularly uh, pleasant to be part of uh, the conversation in this anniversary year of, uh, of uh, Martin Luther's uh, revolutionary postings, not in his time on Facebook, but on the door of the Wittenberg Church Castle. Castle. It is uh, significant then that we consider the theological and social and scientific impact of the spirit of this age of the Reformation that you've referred to uh, numerous times in your presentation. So considering the lecture you, you have offered us and the work that's in your book, I'd like to suggest that one cannot overstate the importance of the project that you have undertaken, this exercise of dialogue um, that you offer between the traditions of science and faith. You've sort of referred to the priestly aspect of science, and many people, I think, believe that science has, in fact, taken over that priestly role in our society so this conversation is indeed an important one. For if theologians are willing to take seriously the world of the physical sciences, I believe they'll open the door for the church to make her special contributions in the important debates of our present age. And if theologians are also trained at a high level in the physical sciences, then I believe certain additional or, uh, doors will be opened because of the joy of the experience of doing physical science, of, of encountering God uh, in this universe that was loved into existence. The ideas then that you've offered about new modes for dialogue between the traditions of religion and science are encouraging, and I think we need to keep looking for these new modes of dialogue. Um, and in offering your suggestions about the history of this conversation about how to carry out the dialogue, you suggest that we need to move beyond some of the older models. And you even suggest your desire to move beyond Stephen Jay Gould's idea of non-overlapping magisteria. I believe we're correct in, in investigating these different models, and in particular in getting rid of the, the warfare model between science and religion. Yet the scientist in me likes this um, uh, non-overlapping magisteria 
uh, model because it's, it's so clear that uh, science won't uh, try and take over religion and religion won't try and take over science, but that um, each of those fields have their own area where they don't have to apologize to another. So as a scientist, I, I always want to uh, retain that special split, that special place where in the blood sport that is a lab meeting, you only have to refer to the data that are sort of normal to science. So having done then the work of the theologian and engaged for us the questions and some of the answers offered by science, I believe there's an additional step which remains. Um, and I believe this additional uh, step is to engage the sense experience and the poetic experience and the linguistic traditions that are current to our age. That is, the joys and the hopes and the fears and anxieties of our particular time. That is, to bring the church into a serious, sympathetic dialogue with the modern world, and in many ways, the modern world as described by science. In our present age, then, there is a wonderfully rich opportunity and indeed a need for us to engage the traditions of science and religion in dialogue and also in dialogue with other forms of human knowledge. For the Christian, we recognize this engagement must be centered in some significant fashion upon our experience of the Incarnation. The Christian tradition, which declares that in the person of Jesus Christ, God has become fully human, this tradition reminds us that we cannot consider God outside of the Incarnation. We must consider God as immersed in the human condition. We must also recall that humanity has been created in the image and likeness of God. Finally, in our age, we need to, to consider the incarnation event in a way that takes serious the things that science and other tradition say about what we understand to be human nature. In such a study, humankind cannot then be regarded as a, a completely known and defined physical manifestation of an eternal idea, but an in-this-world experience as mystery incarnate and evolutionary. For in our human condition, we here propose this evening that God, the creator, and humanity, the created, do in fact experience a special variety of co-inherence. And for this, we give thanks, and this pushes us forward, both in theology and in science, for one to meet the other, that together we may be in dialogue and understand what the mission is that we are given in this world, in, the, in our time. Thank you. Uh, alphabetically, we move to our second speaker, Ashley Moyce, who again is known to many of you here. He is postdoctoral fellow in theology and science here at Regent and Ross's colleague in a grant project that we have thanks to the generosity of the John Templeton Foundation, which is looking at the interaction of faith and science. And his own research and writing has been in theology and ethics and medicine and technology and how all those things work together. Uh, and as a uh, close colleague of Ross's, we wanted to hear from him as well. So, Ashley, thank you. Come join us. Thank you.
first, uh, let me express my gratitude to you, Ross, uh, not only for hiring me, uh, giving me the opportunity to work closely with you, but also for the constructive theological engagement your book brings to bear on discussions that are related to theology and the sciences and to the history of ideas. I read through early versions of your book, uh, and I've reread sections of the book recently. Uh, It's an engaging and well-thought volume. Uh, And with that endorsement, I just expect 10% of all earnings. But in the book, you introduce a phrase which you also repeated in an earlier draft of your lecture tonight. Uh, And you alluded to it. It's one that I want to push back on just a bit so that I might hear your thoughts. The phrase is, matter matters, and is worthy of study. What seems suggested is that the Christian traditions center or ground the valuation of matter for the modern natural sciences. Matter matters, and is worthy of study. But I might argue that for the modern sciences, matter matters only in relation to something else specifically in relation to their potential for use. The metaphysical question here is important to consider. It's important, for I wonder about the nature of matter matter for the modern or late modern natural scientist, for example. But you've argued owes much to theology, but who has been formed quite possibly by a maligned idea or a maligned ideal of nature. Let me explain that further. We've gained much from the Galilean scientific legacy, which measures the world so as to master the world. Galileo Galilei, following after the theories introduced by Nicholas Copernicus, argued that nature was inherently coded by mathematics. It was through such fundamental science that reality behind natural phenomena might be known. Accordingly, Galileo advocated for a systematic study of nature through observation, measurement, and analytical attention to the events of nature, so as to grasp hold of the hidden causes that give way to the expressions of nature. The causes then become no longer tied to the order of myths, theogonies, or fabulations, but instead become hypotheses susceptible to corroboration or refutation by actual experiments. The outcome of Galilean sciences is that the world, and we in it, can be described atomically as discrete forms without connection or correlation to either sensible or teleological foundation. Matter might matter, but it is inert. It is not moving towards being or its fulfillment. Instead, it is being moved by the modern expressions of will reason, and technique. In this way, the world of of Galileo, as with the one described also by Copernicus and perhaps Descartes, and pursued for use by Francis Bacon, among others, is a world more indifferent than ever to human existence, and hence indifferent to whatever knowledge humanity might have of it. In this way, science carried within it the possibility of transforming every datum of our experience into a diachronic object, into a component of a world that gives itself to us as indifferent, in being what it is to whether it is given or not, as Quentin Meliso has commented in his important book, After Finitude. Such indifference, however, is the bulwark for nihilistic temperaments towards matter, That is, if the stuff of nature, including the stuff of human nature, is is indifferent, if if matter exists without an internal telos, a purposed quiditas or whatness, then nature is merely matter. But basic sciences that labor to uncover indifferent matter are not sufficient in the modern period. Rather, among others... Matter must be made meaningful in relation to something else. 
thus escaping meaninglessness. The inert matter, falling after Francis Bacon's imperative, is without significance or meaning until it is put to use. Thus the stuff of nature, including human nature, becomes seen as mere matter awaiting meaning-making agency, awaiting guidance towards production and the know-how of efficient causation. But when the raw material of nature, that inert matter, is proven to be an object without use, it is discarded or disposed of. Consider the words of Hermann Hesse in his Steppenwolf. Quote, Imagine a garden with a hundred kinds of trees, a thousand kinds of flowers, a hundred kinds of fruit and vegetables. Suppose, then, that the gardener of this garden knew no other distinction than between edible and inedible. Nine-tenths of this garden would be useless to him. He would pull up the most enchanting flowers and hew down the noblest trees and even regard them with a loathing and envious eye. Is this what is meant by matter matters? I certainly don't think so. I know you don't think so. But through the Renaissance and Enlightenment, modern science has come to see matter in a particular way. Matter, or nature, becomes delimited not by essence, but by utility. Not by form in a classical sense, but by the possibility to grasp nature, or grasp power over nature to mold matter to form in the modern sense for the benefit, in part, of autonomy or self-making. Nature becomes the, the inert substance with which and by which we, inert substances as well, take advantage over nature to form it, to form ourselves in the image of an ideal order determined by an inframing instrumentality. In the end, it seems to me, The modern sciences have not learned from a theology of nature. Rather, they have learned from a heterodox ontology where matter is seen as a mere resource by which, in using matter to bring about our own image of order or to to make a new Atlantis by our own hands, we try to slip by God on a thousand secret paths, as Bart would say. So I want to ask you, Ross, Does matter actually matter for the modern sciences? How does your theological construction of coherence interrogate and indict the inframing logic that pervades the modern objectification and instrumentalization of matter? If intertwined, how does the idea of coherence, or theology more broadly construed, interrogate or interrupt the heterodox habitus of modern science and technology that trains us to see matter or nature and we in it as a mere object, as dead matter awaiting animation. Thank you. Let me offer brief responses to both of... uh... My responders, thank you so much for taking the time. I think maybe the only comment I would make, Rob, with regard to your uh, response is that I don't think the coherence view does in any way impinge on the freedom of the scientist to do her science. Um, Each is in the other and each is not the other. Uh, From an in-house theological perspective of the Christian, um, I think for me it's important to move beyond Noma. Uh, Otherwise, I'm a dualist. And uh, I want to be able to bring bring these things that are already integral. Um, I want to bring them into that relationship. So, um, thank you. Um, And Ashley, um, matter matters. Um, I defend that concept. It's not uh, matter matters, but it's not an idol. Um, And I think the Enlightenment has made it an idol. And science done without reference to God is, as I said, uh, it becomes empty, um, and more than that, dangerous. Uh, so you reflect on, reflect on the danger of the statement, matter matters, but I want to um, just say that the, the statement was made in the context as over against a Platonist or Gnostic view where matter does not matter or matter is secondary. Uh, we are a faith of the incarnation. We are a faith of 
creation. So in that sense, matter matters. It may be a popular way of saying that, uh, but that's all I meant by it. Um, nevertheless, what you've shared with respect to uh, what I might call a, a naturalist or scientistic view of the universe, matter matters, um, yes, utilit- in a utilitarian way, uh, in ways that, that can indeed become dangerous. With respect to the inertness that you comment on, um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. We can discuss that over coffee tomorrow. Uh, but my sense of... I, I, when I say matter matters, uh, within a, a Christian participational world, world view, I understand that God is at work in matter, um, and that God has even given to matter a freedom to, to participate in what he's doing. Um, so I don't find it to be inert in that sense, but you may mean it in another sense. So that's really all I have to say at this point. Stay there, Rob. Stay there. Okay. So, matter matters. That's been defended. Your questions also matter. Do you have questions? If you do, there's some microphones. Feel free to pop up there and uh, give it a go, and then Ross will uh, do his best to respond. So there's oh, the dean. There's one from here. That's scary. The dean. Yeah. yeah. Better be a good answer to this one. Yeah. yeah. This is a very simple question, Ross. Thank you so much. Was found it uh, very interesting and engaging. I have a question about whether you have in your in your coherence model. Is there any kind of hierarchy? between the two, say, science and theology? Does, it, does one have precedence over the other in the final analysis? Is there one kind of knowledge or one epistemology that actually sets the tone for the other? And I got the sense in one place that perhaps you think that science actually ha- is the final arbiter of truth. Um, so just one of the things that you, I think you said was uh, when you, in the example of... Um, Talking about evolution, you say that scripture is compatible with evolution when it's properly read. The implication seems to be that reading scripture properly in that case is to find it compatible with evolution, which seems to say that then science is the arbiter of a proper reading of scripture. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Uh, no, I, I don't mean that as, and at all. Um, science has to be considered and... Uh, what tends to happen in the history of the church is that when we do, do discover science, things that are known by science, uh, then we tend to re- we revisit Scripture, is another way to say it. And uh, as we uh, engage in what might be called proper interpretation, um, then we discover what we thought it said is not exactly what it said. So there, there is an iteration, for example, between science and theology. But for me, I, I was, I, I'd hoped I'd, I'd state that pretty clearly. I believe theology is the queen of the sciences. Therefore, it is. there are two aspects of that, and my book goes into this in some depth. One is that uh, one must distinguish between conciliar or creedal theology, uh, and I take the step of faith, seeking understanding, that nothing in science will ever contradict that. It may illumine it, but the, 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 the faith uh, that Jude speaks about, the faith once delivered to all the saints, that which has been perpetuated through the Apostles' Creed and the nicene constantinopolitan Creed and on down, um, that what we might call conciliar theology is, if you like, the queen of the sciences. Um, but as such, it must also, therefore, incorporate um, into itself what might be called a second level of theology, theology order two, which is uh, an encyclopedic theology. Um, There needs to be a theology of chemistry. There needs to be a theology of physics, a theology of biology. As we reflect in light of the scriptures, in light of the tradition, upon these things, and we also receive what we're learning from them as best we can, we will articulate, uh, hopefully, um, an accessible and understandable um, and wise theology of all of these things. So theology is both conciliar and encyclopedic. And um, and, and, and in in the sense that theology must take into itself awareness of all reality, I think, therefore, it is still okay to speak of it as the queen of sciences, which goes back a long time. Uh, Yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. Hastings. Uh, My question has to do with the vestigium trinitatis that you attempt to find in creation. From what I've read from, like, Augustine and um, Aquinas, most of that has been justified from a sort of participatory ontology, 
um, a sharing in the being, a cause-effect uh, resemblance between creation, which is, again, grounded in a Hellenistic philosophy. But uh, from what I've read of Bart and T.F. Torrance, it seems that they sort of want to do away with that problem that sort of assumes any sort of uh, uh, Hellenistic philosophy whatsoever. So my, I guess my question is, is how can we assume a cause-effect resemblance, um, which uh, I feel like the, the project we're undergoing is, assuming a cause-effect, so that we can therefore ground vestigium trinitatis in creation without resorting to Hellenistic philosophy? Yeah, that's a good question and a big one, um, because it it asks for clarification on what participation means. And there are two, generally two types of thinking around participation, one which is more material participation and one which is more koinonia, the sort of participation of creation and God in terms of God's providential care of it um, without a material participation, which is more of a platonic concept. So I'm pretty sure that Torrance and Bart would favor that view um, over, over the Hellenistic one, and I think you're right in that regard. Um, so, yeah, um, I, you know, I, I do think vestigia trinitatis is a result of perhaps two things, modeling and participation. And the kind of participation needs to be carefully thought, and this is, this is something ongoing. I got really curious uh, on your talk. You mentioned the division between science and humanities um, and I'd like you to clarify a little bit how you define and see science uh, as approach the book and parallel to that how do you then understand and see we call today like human science that this interface between the classical humanities with techniques from the classical science as well uh, and how you see other fields like philosophy and some, some people would put psychoanalysis or psychology as a nearly science or science fashion. Uh, and how this coherence model then interwine these other fields as well that you put partially, at least in your talk, I don't know if you see like that, as humanities, not science. Itself. Yeah. Um, the humanities and the sciences can be quite blurred. I was just simply referring to that's how we've classified them, and that's that we've tended to divide them rather than to bring them together. That was the point of that comment. Um, you know, how we classify the sciences, there are all different ways in which sciences have been classified in terms of soft science versus hard science. Social sciences tend to be the softer sciences, and natural sciences being the harder sciences. I, I, I believe that what I've said refers to all of the sciences, and that um, had I an opportunity and... Uh, if you'd like to read the last chapter of the book, you'll see how I think the sciences and the arts come together. And they come together with this doxological orientation. Uh, they come together around the theme of beauty. Once you start talking about beauty, it's wrong to say there's beauty in the arts and there's beauty in the sciences. Uh, because beauty is everywhere, and that reflects on the God who is himself beautiful. Three persons in relation and complete harmony. So ultimately, that distinction breaks down. Yeah, question over here. Uh, thank you for your lecture. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I'm a scientist myself, and, and I'm sure my question will be naive, but um, it, it occurs to me that you make a, a very strong case for uh, the emergence of science being critically dependent on Christian um, theology. Uh, and yet, when you think about uh, the times after the rise of Islam, for years, Islamic science actually eclipsed Christian science, uh, particularly in the areas of astronomy, as you were uh, discussing earlier. Um, d does this suggest that it is something inherent in the notion of a, a, a one God religion rather than Christianity itself that mm. spurs science? Well, that's a very searching question. Um, I think that uh, th there's probably something to be said about um, monotheism and particularly the kind of God of Islam and the order and the power that's associated with that conceiving of deity, therefore being in some ways conducive to science or looking uh, to creation, even having a theology of creation that invites that 
inquisitiveness, that curiosity. I mean, I, I'm not here to do a comparison of Islam and, and the Christian faith, but I do, in, in light of what I've been sharing in this book, I'm obviously making a, I'm, I'm making a case for the fact that the fully Trinitarian understanding of God as God as the, as the one God who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ um, has many more reasons for its compatibility with science, um, and particularly the incarnation by which God becomes one uh, with creation in a, in a, in a special sense. Uh, but yes, that, that's, there, there is science uh, within Islam, and there's, there is some science in the ancient Chinese background as well. But it seems as though it prospered. Um, I'm not sure I would say it's critically important for it to have been, uh, but rather it, it was permitted within that, and perhaps there were impulses. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Right, right. Yeah, thank you. Good. will be our last question. Oh, okay, last question. Um, Hi, Ross. I look forward to reading the book and having further conversations with you about it. Uh, I actually take the view that a certain amount of tension and even conflict between theology and science or Christianity and science is a pretty healthy thing Mm -hmm. uh, for us all because they uh, uh, correct one another's uh, quest for power. Mm. And there have been a number of times in history when the uh, the confluence of cooperation, the collaboration between religion and science, uh, between theology and some particular science, has resulted in some pretty bad things. Uh, does your echoes of coherence uh, have within it, I don't know if you address it in the book, I'll be interested to find, but does it, do you imagine that it has within it uh, guardrails for that kind of collaboration uh, toward uh, a, a quest for power and really bad stuff happening. It probably is implicit, but not explicit. That's a great idea, and maybe for my next book, I will uh, try to incorporate that, John, because that's, that, that's an extremely good idea. And I mean that in all seriousness, because you know, I, I just, you know, my aim was limited in terms of Let's show a way in which we can dialogue well. And um, that's the passion behind the book. But when I say maybe implicitly, if one does, um, you know, for example, if a scientist actually realize the metaphysical nature of what they do as a first step, um, that a- along with... Uh, Christians validating and understanding the importance of science in, in, its, best, in its best sense. Um, that will enable, I think, a conversation that's a good one. Uh, and if the triune God is over all of this, then um, perhaps the coherence, especially of persons, I, I made a comment in the, in the early part of the lecture, and there's, so there's a chapter on the image of God and the traces, and then two or three chapters on the traces. So humanity images God, but I would I argue that creation and the sciences, therefore, show traces of God. Um, but part of our image-bearing is indeed the care of creation. It's the responsibility um, that, that, that is incumbent upon all scientists to think about this planet and where it's going and what it's doing. So absolutely, creation care is, is, is crucial to all of that, as well as just a general attitude of tolerance and... Um, loving dialogue between people who may disagree on things. But thanks. Ross, stay right here for a moment. Thank you very much for a stimulating evening, and we congratulate you on the achievement of the book and its appearance, and look forward to further conversation and with the ideas that it's put into conversation. Great. So let's thank Ross for a lovely evening.